So, one D and D, one dice to rule them all, and in the darkness bind them. Okay, that might be a little bit much. Everybody in my friend group has their own hot take, their own strongly worded opinions on this particular thing. Whether it be the people dreading another edition war, which we knew this was coming. If you didn't know this was coming, you are a damn fool. Or you have the people who are like, oh, gr oh good, more 5e easy mode. We should, we should go back to the early stuff. So it's only natural that I have the compulsion to give my own hot take. But I'm not exactly sure how hot my take is going to be. But I will say this. I think 1D&D &D is going to be its own worst enemy. Now, I don't say that kind of thing because of monsters not being able to crit or anything like that. I That's small potatoes. What I mean by it's going to be its own worst enemy is how they are rolling out the test material. Instead of doing something smart, like making a vertical slice and putting that out and getting feedback on that, the same way everybody else does testing... They're making the same mistake that I talked about in the Valley of the Judge series on Level Up 5e. Releasing rule sets in packets on a monthly, semi-monthly basis. Starting with the Origins packet that came out a few days ago at the time of this recording. Apparently there's going to be another one that comes out next month, and in the interim there will be surveys on each. I have a massive problem with this because... By releasing these things in isolation with each other, it is going to be several months or even a year before people are able to get a handle on how these things are going to intersect. And the meanwhile, the people who are doing playtesting are going to have to constantly play catch-up to see what new thing may have invalidated or has a different context with what came before. This is the reason why most games that I've covered don't do this segmented approach. Instead, they'll do a quick start that might have a gimped version of character creation and a sample module. Hell, this is the whole gimmick with free RPG day. Most quick starts are like this. Trying to reinvent the wheel doesn't exactly do much if you end up breaking it. Now, as far as the origin document itself, it's all right. I do find it kind of amusing that you're getting feats right out of the gate when 5th edition was trying so desperately to minimize feats and minimize personalization as a whole, unless you're a spellcaster, or one of the classes with feet likes, warlocks and monks being two major examples of this kind of thing. The only way to get feats was through a alternative to ability score improvement, which in my initial review of 5th edition I said was a bad idea, I still think it's a bad idea, and it is emblematic of a design ethos that is all about minimizing how you can personalize your abilities. And before anyone asks, being able to roleplay it is a bandage, not a fix. But that's just the appetizer. I wanted to get into the main course, which is their intention, or at least announced intention, to make a virtual tabletop specifically for D&D. To invoke a certain meme, that's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see how it pays off for them. The virtual tabletop scene is very crowded, with Roll20 having the biggest market share, but in the last few years, stuff like Foundry and the open-source Mythic Table have been slowly creeping up. It looked like Astral was going to kick the bucket, but it managed to get saved at the 11th hour, and stuff like Fantasy Grounds has always been there. And that's not getting into some of the role-playing assisting bots that are on Discord and other services. There was also that alchemy project that looked fairly promising, but I haven't looked too deep into that. The point is, this is what it has to compete with. And if it doesn't offer the same level of features as those aforementioned entries, it's going to be seen as wanting, regardless of having the D&D name. You're especially going to have an issue with the relationship that D&D has with Roll20, and you need to make something good enough to get people to abandon all their macros that they have on Roll20 to jump on your VTT. I would say the smart thing would be to just acquire the ore group and use Roll20 as the exclusive, but that has its own problems, obviously, and I don't think anybody wants a riot on their hands. Now, I have the feeling that this is going to be built upon the framework that is currently present with D&D Beyond. 
That's not exactly a ringing endorsement, because a big problem that I have with D&D Beyond, and a problem that I suspect I would have with the virtual tabletop setup that they're planning, is a lack of user and social features. Now, people are going to house rule. People are going to homebrew. They're going to hack. They're going to do overhauls. This is the nature of the beast. Trying to go with a, this is the way you're supposed to play, well, TSR tried that in the past, and we saw how that worked out. As a general rule, I am not fond of games that try and hyper-focus on the right way you're supposed to play them. In doing so, you end up bottlenecking the kind of stories that can be told for a means that's, frankly, unnecessary. And if you want to go even further, it's somewhat antithetical to the concepts of role-playing as outlined by Gygax. You look through any GM section of any role-playing game proper, and you'll usually find something about making the game your own. With Beyond, for whatever reason, even though you can make subclasses, you can make items, you can make feats, you can make spells, you can't make new classes. And if this is to get people to use the base classes, well, sometimes those base classes might not fit somebody's campaign. Of course, this doesn't mean that you can't host those new classes elsewhere, but if Beyond is supposed to be this repository for character management, and this is supposed to be expanded upon to campaign management, then I find myself saying what I said when I first saw Beyond. What exactly is it offering that I can't get through Hero Lab or some of its competitors? Just having the name D&D is not going to be sufficient. It may be sufficient for that hyper-casual audience that they want to cater to so much, but that hyper-casual audience doesn't stick around. This is something that I tried to hint at in my overview of why people drop off at high levels. It's half the design and half the focus on new players, instead of focusing on bringing new players in and making them into experts or to put it another way, to make them want to stick around at those higher levels. It's entirely possible that I'm just being outwardly negative, but I've been here before with the idea of D&D wanting to do a virtual tabletop, and that never got off the ground either. My big concern with their attempt at a virtual tabletop is that it's going to heavily restrict the user-generated content, and in doing so, it's going to get outclassed by its competitors to the point where the only people who would stick around with their virtual tabletop are people more associated with the brand than with gaming. Time will tell if this ends up being a prophecy in two years, but for now, all I'd say is that I'm not exactly optimistic. Also, it's a little hard for me to be impressed with whatever they have planned when Heavens and Heresies has completely outclassed them in terms of design. But we will see how it plays out. Best case scenario, I end up laughing once again. Stay frosty.